Similar to Sydney, early 20th century Melbourne was experiencing a boom in passenger traffic. Between 1901 and 1911, the population only increased from 500,000 to 600,000, but total passenger journeys skyrocketed from 50 million per annum to 86.5 million per annum. As a result of this, in 1907, the Victorian government began to investigate the possibility of electrification. Again, like Sydney, Melbourne had some experience with electrification through its tram network. With the first section electrified between Box Hill and Doncaster in 1889, Although this wasn't a great success, with it being removed in 1896, it still paved the way for future tramway electrification, with the Victorian Railways opening a new electrified line between St Kilda and Brighton in 1906, which proved much more successful. In 1903, Thomas Tate was appointed the Chairman of the Commissioners of the Victorian Railways. Being a Canadian, he was already familiar with some of the interurban systems that had sprung up across North America in the late 1890s and early 1900s. In 1907, he was tasked with assessing electrification systems around the world and also finding a suitable engineer to undertake this work in Melbourne. The man chosen for this task was an Englishman by the name of Charles Mers, whose previous notable project was the North Eastern Railway's Tyneside Electrics in his native Newcastle-upon-Tyne. In June 1908, Charles Mers delivered his first report on the electrification of the Melbourne suburban system. For our purposes, I'm going to skip over most of the details as they'll be in a future video. Suffice to say, his report recommended that almost the entire network be electrified. In the report, there were two major debates. The first was whether Melbourne should use locomotives or electric multiple units for its new electric fleet. Locomotives had the advantage that the carriages wouldn't need to be modified to convert them to electric service. But electric multiple units had the advantage that they could accelerate faster, had consistent performance regardless of train length, and simpler reversing at terminus stations. The report also debated how the power should get to the trains, of which the report settled on three main options. An unprotected third rail at 600 volt DC, a protected third rail at 800 volt DC, and an overhead 6 to 10 kilovolt AC system. Curiously, the two examples MERS uses are the Hamburg to Altona line in Germany and the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad, which at the time used 6.3 kilovolt at 25 hertz and 11 kilovolt at 25 hertz respectively. So more than likely, if Melbourne pursued AC electrification, it would have been one of these two systems, but most likely the German 6.3 kilovolt system. In the end, Mers recommended that Melbourne should go forward with the 800 volt DC protected third rail system on account of it being cheaper to install and DC motors being simpler and lighter than equivalent AC motors. As for the multiple units, his report also recommended that trains should be composed of equal numbers of motor and trailer cars, with general train operation consisting of two, four, six or eight cars and one car trains for outlying routes. For this, the full fleet was expected to consist of 9 motor cars with cabs at both ends for the aforementioned single car trains, 241 motor cars with one cab, 78 driving trailers and 168 plane trailers for a total fleet of 496 cars. Of these, 305 cars would be converted from existing suburban bogey compartment stock, while the rest would be made up of either 124 converted corridor coaches from country services and 67 newly built stock, or 191 newly built carriages. For the converted suburban and country stock, these were all built with wooden bodies and steel frames, which meant that they could be converted for electric service, but they were all of different lengths, ranging from 13.7 to about 15.2 meters long. The report recommended that these cars be standardized and lengthened to 18.2 meters. Finally, with the new built stock, there was some debate on whether they should be corridor stock with doors at each end or cross compartment stock with doors on the side. Each design had a few advantages and drawbacks. Corridor stock had the advantage that it could be built simpler and stronger since the lack of doors allowed the body to be effectively a single girder. The corridor design also allowed passengers to traverse from one carriage to the next while in transit. It also had the advantage that train attendants can be stationed at the ends of carriages to operate the doors and hurry passengers when the train is due to depart. This both improved safety and allowed the train to depart before the doors had closed. The downside was, 
crewing the doors was expensive, and without attendants, loading and unloading took longer with the comparatively small doors at the end of the coach. This style of operation and coach design was effective on systems like the London Underground and New York City Subway due to its ability to handle large crowds and short station stops. But for Melbourne, this was overkill. Because of this, it was decided to use a hybrid design where the train would be of a cross compartment design but with a corridor through the centre of the coach. This had the benefit of allowing trains to load and unload quickly without the added expense of door attendance. One major design change from the converted suburban stock was the use of sliding doors instead of swing doors. This allowed the passengers to close the doors while the train was in motion without endangering themselves, which helped to reduce station dwell times. Sliding doors also allowed the new cars to be built to the maximum width of 2.9 meters instead of the previous 2.6 meter width. This had the benefit of if the doors were left open, there was no risk of the doors hitting anything and the extra width also helped to boost capacity. Both the new build and converted stock would have class arrangements with first and second class accommodations with smoking and non-smoking areas for both classes. In terms of the electrical systems, the trains would have two motors mounted on one bogey. The voltage, power rating of the motors and location of the power bogey are contained within the plates of the 1908 report. But unfortunately, they have not been digitized, so I have to do some guesswork. My guess would be the two motors would be connected in series at 800 volts and produce around 200 to 250 horsepower. According to the report, the motors were to be powered by third rail contact shoes on both sides of the motor bogey. Because the power source was a third rail, the trains would have an 800 volt continuous conductor throughout the length of the train connected to all the contact shoes and motors. So if the train traversed a section without a third rail, such as level crossing or set of points, the train would still have power. Unfortunately, due to a variety of factors, Victorian Railways rejected the 1908 report. But after substantial patronage growth in the following years, the Victorian government undertook a royal commission in 1911, which recommended suburban railway electrification. By this time, Charles Mers had returned to the UK and had completed the electrification of the Northeastern Railway's Shildon to Newport line at 1500 volt DC overhead line. In 1912, he was asked to update his report. One of the new considerations was expanding the electric network outside of the metropolitan area, with the main candidate being the line to Bendigo. Since 800 volt DC third rail would be too expensive and impractical for this purpose, it was decided to seek a new system. The two candidates were the 1500 volt DC overhead line or an AC overhead line between 6 and 10 kilovolt. 1500 volt DC proved to be overall cheaper for metropolitan operations as DC motors were smaller and less complex and the actual insulation costs for the system would be lower. But AC had the advantage of requiring fewer substations for a larger area, which would make it more suitable for electrification over a long distance. As it stood, DC proved to be about 30% cheaper for electrifying the suburban area. But if AC proved significantly cheaper for future extensions, then it would be the choice. The problem is, AC only proved to be about 2.4% cheaper than DC for long distance electrification. As a result, the 1912 report recommended that Melbourne should proceed with a 1500 volt DC overhead line system. In late 1912, the Victorian government accepted Mers' recommendations and commissioned him to oversee the project, with electric services slated to begin in 1917. At the same time, due to the aforementioned increase in patronage, new carriages would be built by the Newport Railway Workshops starting in 1909, and these were based on the 1908 MERS report design. But beginning in 1912, these would be modified to have a depression in the roof to make space for a pantograph. In 1914, the First World War kicked off, which made electric services beginning in 1917 less likely. One of the main issues was that some of the component manufacturers were located in Germany, which Australia was now at war with. So other manufacturers elsewhere had to be selected, mostly in the United Kingdom and United States. The other issue was a lack of manpower. Fighting a war requires soldiers, and for Melbourne, that meant a large part of their workforce was off in Europe. Because of both of these issues, electrification wasn't completed until 1919. Beginning in 1917, the trains we now know as the Swing Door, named after their swing doors, and Tate's, named after the designer, Chief Mechanical Engineer Sir Thomas Tate, began to take shape. 
with stock being converted to electric service. Beginning in October 1918, newly converted swing door and tape trains began testing and crew training on the Flemington Racecourse Line. On the 18th of May 1919, the first full revenue service test began with an electric train completing the run between Sandringham and Essendon. By the end of 1919, Melbourne had 38.8 route kilometres of electrified trackage. By the end of 1923, the original planned routes were electrified with a total of 204.2 route kilometres fully electrified and operational. By the time Sydney began electric operation on the 1st of March 1926, Melbourne had reached a total of 234.5 route kilometres and it was still growing. By 1930, it was 265.8 kilometres. You probably won't be shocked to find out that this resulted in a large growth in patronage. Between 1918 and 1919, there were 103.7 million trips on Melbourne suburban trains. By 1926 and 1927, this had grown to 160 million per annum. Suffice to say that Melbourne needed more than the 496 cars in the 1908 MERS report. By 1922, Melbourne had constructed a fleet of 710 electric cars. Of these, 288 were converted swing door cars, while 422 were built to the Tate design. By 1926, a total of 526 Tates were in service. Cars entered service as either M, T, B, T or D cars. M cars have motors in a driving cab, T and B, T cars being plain trailers without motors or a driving cab, and D cars being driving trailers with a cab but no motors. It is important to note that in general, motor cars were all second class while all trailers were first class, the exception obviously being the BT trailers, which were second class as well. Prior to 1921, this was suffixed onto the steam service designation. For example, ACP cars became ACPM or ACPD. This was mostly done to differentiate the swing door and Tate stock, but post-1921, this was simplified to just a car type, so ACPM would just become M. To differentiate stock, Swing door stock was designated 1 through 200, while Tate stock was designated as 200 and above. This was also divided by type, for example, 94T and 94M would be different cars. There were also cars coded as G, which could be best described as Tate and swing door hybrids. During the lengthening process of the swing doors, there were several excess underframes. Instead of just scrapping them, in 1923 it was decided to repurpose them into additional carriages. These eventually became the PL and G type carriages. Both are very similar, but the PL carriages were exclusively built for country services behind steam locomotives, while G carriages were built for electric and steam hauled country services. Because of this, the G type carriages had both electric lighting for electric service and gas lighting for country service. In periods of low suburban traffic, such as Easter, Christmas or New Year's, G type carriages would be reallocated to country trains to boost capacity. In total, 288 swing doors were converted between 1917 and 1924, which consisted of 144 motor cars, of which 10 were double ended, 32 driving trailers, and 112 plane trailers, of which 35 were the second class BT type. The Tate fleet was built between 1910 and 1951 and consisted of 259 motor cars of which four were double-ended, but these were converted from existing driving trailers. There were 24 driving trailers built. There were an additional 48 ringer trailers, which were driving trailers, but entered service as plane trailers with a guards compartment having passenger seats installed and a white circle on what would have been the guards door. Six of these cars were converted to driving trailers between 1926 and 1927 with additional 40 following between 1965 and 1972, with the remaining two as trailers until retirement. The rest of the fleet consisted of 181 plane trailers, excluding the aforementioned 48 ringer trailers, and 103 G-type trailers, giving a grand total of 615 Tate cars built. As you can probably guess, these cars didn't use the same electrical equipment as in the 1908 report. The final cars used a single pan diamond pantograph with a steel contact, which is also why Melbourne had so many greaser trains, it was to lubricate the overhead line. The pantographs contacted a 1500 volt DC overhead line, they then fed that voltage in parallel to each bogey at 750 volts, which was then connected to twin motors per bogey, 
both of which are in series. The motors themselves are controlled by semi-automatic stepped resistor control and produce 140 horsepower each, with each motor car having approximately 560 horsepower. Auxiliary power for lighting, air compressors and heaters provided by motor generators wound for the correct voltage. Additionally, there was a continuous conductor throughout the train for both the control and auxiliary power circuits, but not for the traction voltage, as this wasn't necessary for trains using an overhead line. Both Tate and swing door cars shared the same electrical equipment and as such could work together as multiple units. In general operation, trains generally were segregated by type, with Tates working with Tates and swing doors working with swing doors, although there are exceptions. And each train type was made up into what were referred to as blocks, pairs or units. Blocks were four car trains in an MTTM configuration. Pairs were similar but were of an MD-MD configuration and could be split into two car trains for off-peak services. These were often coupled to a unit which consisted of three cars in a GTM or BTTM configuration. Often, units would be removed from the end of the train and stored at Jollymont workshops during the off-peak period. It is also important to note that the G and BT trailers had additional shunters cocks to aid in coupling and decoupling. There were also the aforementioned double-ended motor cars, which consisted of a single motor car, but could work in normal blocks or units if need be. A group of Tate and swing door motor cars were also configured into what were called E-trains, where two motor cars operating back to back would haul suburban or country stock to the end of the electric network, where the motor cars would be swapped out for locomotives, which would then take the cars to their final destination. This practice ended in 1958 when Walker Rail Motors took over and operations changed from through coaches to passengers changing train at the end of the line. Additionally, there were three car MTD and six car MTTTTM trains that were used in peak hours, although they were generally restricted to flatter lines due to the lack of power. This is a very general overview and it does change depending on the year and the line, so this isn't 100% accurate. Beginning in 1925, Tate motor cars were delivered with curved roofs instead of clerestory roofs. In 1929, some of the swing door trailer cars were converted back to steam hall stock due to extra Tate cars coming into service. In 1939, a train with swing door cars 18 and 44M were involved in a collision at Croydon and were rebuilt with Tate bodies, although still on swing door frames, which created a noticeable overhang and were renumbered 442 and 443M. In 1940 and 1941, 20 swing door trailers were converted to second class BT trailers, which were followed by an additional six in 1957, two in 1963, six in 1965, and one in 1968. In 1950, Tate car 441T was unfinished and was converted to test car 201B, which was built to an altered design to test features that would later go on to form the basis for the Harris cars. In 1958, travel classes were abolished on the Suburban network. In 1968, as swing door cars began their retirement, four Tate motor cars were converted to have additional cabs on their rear ends and were numbered 470 through 473M. In 1978, smoking was also abolished on the Suburban network. Starting in the 1950s, the swing door trains began to be replaced by newer Harris and later Hitachi trains. This process was fully completed by the end of 1973. The tastes lasted a little longer with their retirement beginning in 1974 with the Hitachi trains coming in, but their final retirement came with the introduction of the Comens trains in 1981, with the final tape being removed from service at the end of 1984. Curiously, in the final years, Tates were allowed in the city loop when it opened in 1981, but were banned in 1982 as the wooden bodies posed a major fire risk. A fair portion of the Tates and swing doors were disposed of by burning, but after a while, this spurred complaints. In 1985, the Great Carriage Auction was held, where the final Tate trains and parts were sold off to fundraise for the Australian Railway Historical Society. There were also several cars converted for other purposes the first major type of note are the parcel motors. I plan on doing a video on them in detail, so I'm just going to skim over them. Simply put, in 1921, 
Victorian Railways wanted to increase the capacity of its metropolitan parcels network. Thus, two Tate coaches were built, coded 1CM and 2CM. These were built with a similar design to the double-ended Tate motor cars, although without passenger accommodations, and three large sliding doors per side for loading and unloading. In 1923, a third parcel motor entered service, coded 3CM, although this new one was different, with an additional cupola in the centre of the car for overhead line inspection. An additional two cars, coded 4 and 5CM, entered service in 1925 and 1926 respectively. These cars were effectively identical to the first two cars, although they had the post-1925 curved roof design. These were supplemented in 1955 by six swing door double-ended motor cars that had been retired. They were numbered 10 through 15 cm, although 14 and 15 cm were only converted temporarily and then promptly retired. 10 cm was also built with an overhead inspection cupola like 3 cm. In 1988, the Victorian government switched to road haulage for parcel traffic and the parcel motors were then retired. The next type were the Jollymont Workshop shunters. Parcel motors occasionally did this work, but there were two dedicated double-end swing door motor cars for this job. They were coded 113 and 156M. These were mostly used to assemble trains of service, as well as general transport duties around and between Jollymont and Newport workshops. The main noticeable modification is the addition of a second pantograph. They served in this role until being retired in 1990. The final type were the overhead inspection and greaser trains. When being used for overhead inspection, the previously mentioned 3 and 10 cm were coupled between two normal motor cars. In 1979, Tate car 447M was stored awaiting retirement until it was decided to convert it to a greaser and overhead inspection vehicle, with the re-entering service in 1981. It was painted all yellow with many of the windows covered over and the text overhead inspection written on the side. The main modification being the addition of a second pantograph on the rear of the car with a catch board at the end of the car to catch grease that falls off the pantograph, as well as the obvious inspection cupola. In 1993, it was renumbered as 1447M. In 1994, the steel skid plates on suburban trains were replaced with carbon, which removed the need for grease in the overhead line. In 1995, it was painted all yellow after being graffitied with it finally being retired in 2003. After retirement, quite a few cars were put into preservation. Similar to Sydney's Red Rattlers, there's too many to go over in detail, but the main group with preserved Tate and swing door cars is Elec Rail, which is part of Steam Rail Victoria. In terms of swing door cars, Elec Rail has three cars, 93, 113 and 156M. 113 and 156M, if you remember, were the Jollymont Workshop shunters. Additionally, Elec Rail had four more cars, 107M, 12AT, 24D, and 137M, but these were unfortunately destroyed in a fire at Newport Workshops in 2015. These were planned to be part of an operational set for heritage tours, and were only weeks away from full restoration when it happened. Elec Rail also has 12 total take cars, including five operational cars, number 317 and 381M, 208, 230, and 341T all of which are commonly used for heritage tours, which began in March 2022. Other groups include the Mornington Peninsula Railway, which have Tate Car 98G in their care, and 1447M, which was the greaser and overhead inspection car, is still owned by VicTrack, but is stored. Quite a few Tate cars are now distributed around Australia, as railway themed restaurants, sheds, or displays, and there's too many to list. With that, we reach the end. So to conclude, the Tate and Swing Doors fill foundational roles in the history of electric traction in Australia. They were the first electric trains used in suburban service in Australia, and the decisions made in their design process contributed to the design of Sydney's and Wellington's trains in the following years. They were also one of the last trains of an era where everything was done internally, from design to construction to conversion, which did make some of the research for this video painful to say the least but it's still a notable aspect in my opinion. Similar to Sydney's Red Rattlers, the Melbourne Rattlers appeared very long in the tooth in their final years, and their early 20th century design was contrasted by the sleek stainless steel of the new Hitachi and Commons trains. But their historical importance and charming appearance 
means I'll always find them interesting.